Okay, thanks very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation to come here and participate in this uh, summit. Uh, my talk will indeed be uh, different. I won't say much about yogurt. I think the word yogurt appears once in my uh, presentation. But uh, what I will talk about is the, it will be relevant for uh, most uh, dairy products. And we'll talk about uh, the uh, efficiency of energy and uh, protein uh, conversion by dairy cows. So the context is uh, dealing with uh, food security is a massive uh, challenge for mankind. Um, food demand is, is growing, uh, also water, energy. So food has been a uh, hot issue for the last uh, five years, and we can see that on the growing number of students coming to, uh, to Wageningen. Um, the latest conclusion of FAO is that uh, the world resources would be sufficient to, uh, to feed everybody, uh, but as usual, the devil is, uh, is local. Local in the sense that there will still will be 300 million people undernourished in uh, 2050, and the other devil is, of course, the, what we heard before, the, uh, the obesity uh, uh, issue. Uh, we will find, if there are no successful interventions for this uh, problem, I think it is even worse than the undernourished. We have more people uh, uh, obese than undernourished. That's a catastrophe in itself. Um, so, um, talking about uh, dairy, we uh, have to look at, uh, at the protein as well. Protein, uh, from an agricultural point of view, is the most limiting uh, macronutrient for food security. It is the most expensive one, and, it is, uh, and that was a conclusion of the report uh, we already heard before, the Dietary Protein Quality Evaluation, the recent report of the FAO, that the quality of a protein should come in the equation of uh, protein efficiency, and I will show you uh, an example later on. Uh, how will the milk demand grow? Uh, due to population growth and uh, the uh, rise of income in the emerging markets, the uh, estimate is that the milk demand will grow by uh, around 50%, so from the current uh, 720 billion kilogram to over 1,000 billion kilogram in 2050. And even more important is, uh, where does the new milk come? And where will it be consumed? So here you can see that uh, especially the new milk will be in the developing countries. So there will be a shift from milk production from the developed countries to the developing countries. And even the, the developing country will produce more milk in 2050 than the developed countries. And this is an important uh, change and uh, requires a lot of, uh, of knowledge uh, to, to be generated in these countries. And last week I was in China, uh, was setting up a dairy development center together with the Chinese Agricultural University. So there's an urgent need to uh, transfer uh, science uh, knowledge to the countries where the new milk will eventually be, be uh, produced. At the moment, uh, livestock uh, products provide 70% of the energy in the world on average and 35% of the protein. So basically, livestock products are more important for protein uh, intake than for energy intake. But there's a large uh, variation by, by region. Uh, more animal product in diets of low intake countries uh, leads to an uh, improvement of growth, cognitive development, and health. That was concluded by the FAO. And only small amounts of uh, animal products already do a lot of uh, uh, good work for the uh, special vulnerable group children, pregnant women, elderly. In high intake countries, products also contribute to adverse effects, uh, mainly caused by excessive uh, energy intake. So looking more uh, in detail, so for the protein uh, in the developed world, uh, animal products uh, deliver almost 60% of the protein, 
and in the developing world, 26%. Uh, and for the energy, it is 27 compared to 11. Looking at the Netherlands and compare dairy and meat, you can see that uh, meat is the highest uh, source for protein. Uh, second uh, is dairy. Uh, for energy, it is 30 for meat and 15% uh, uh, for, uh, for dairy. So uh, animal products are very important in the uh, nutrient security uh, uh, debate, but the perception is that animal foods are inefficient, inefficient use of resources. Here you see a quote of the uh, Health Council in the Netherlands. The production of meat and dairy forms the biggest food-related burden. This is because of the inefficient production. Uh, the production of a single kilo of meat protein requires six kilos of vegetable protein. So let's have a, a closer look, because I think there's another way of looking at it as well. Uh, so that's, and one should combine uh, the, the position of dairy in a diet uh, should not only relate, of course, to the sustainability aspect, but um, more to the nutritional aspect. So what we should do is uh, balance uh, in our analysis, in our uh, evaluation, the nutrient security aspects of, of uh, the dairy products and the environmental impact. There are not many models doing that at the moment. It's slowly appearing in literature. There are a couple of examples. And we in Wageningen are setting up a, uh, a new product where we try to model via linear program programming techniques the nutrient security aspects, the environmental aspects, and the affordability aspects of dairy and a complete diet. And I give you an example later on of, uh, of, an, of such an analysis. So dairy uh, is an important uh, source of, uh, of many nutrients. Uh, this is the Dutch situation, 25% protein, uh, zinc, B, uh, B2, vitamin B12, uh, calcium, and on the other side, you have the, the greenhouse gas emissions and the uh, use of resources. So, um, if uh, I only this is the only slide I have on the, the nutrition aspects of uh, of dairy. This is a an, uh, an, uh, meta-analysis meta by Elwood, and you can see that there is a slight uh, beneficial. Uh, 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 effect of dairy consumption on uh, survival. And here you have the, the number of deaths in the Netherlands for the different uh, gonadal diseases here. So you can see that, uh, that in this analysis, uh, dairy gives you a uh, survival advantage. Uh, now coming to the sustainability aspects, this is the latest report of FAO. It is a follow-up of the, of the report uh, uh, livestock long, uh, shadow, and 50% of the greenhouse gas emission in the world is coming from uh, livestock. Uh, in the old report, it was 80% uh, is coming down a little bit, and uh, the contribution of milk is 2.8%. Uh, so the m milk is uh, is less than other livestock uh, categories. Uh, it's 2.8%. Uh, but it's quite different in, in different parts of the world. And you can see that, uh, that greenhouse gas emission in the world is uh, 2.4 kilograms per kilogram milk, but in different uh, regions, it, and that has to do with uh, the efficiency of a dairy cow, it, is, uh, it can be quite high. And uh, in the Netherlands, it's at, uh, at a 1.4 level. So the... Uh, the um, important uh, greenhouse gases for the dairy sector are uh, methane, that's 52%, nitrous oxide, 35%, and car carbon dioxide is only 30%. So if all carbon use would come back as carbon, there wouldn't be such a, a problem with livestock. But uh, the carbon uh, intake, the intake by dairy cow is, uh, is converted to uh, methane and uh, leftovers of, uh, of uh, manure and plants on the, on the soil are, uh, uh, so, uh, are, are 
uh, appearing in the air as nitrous oxide, which has a high uh, global warming potential, as you may know. So this is the slide with the yogurt. Uh, if you look at uh, the greenhouse gas emission of the different dairy products, and this is a, a study from Scotland. There are not many studies uh, so detailed as uh, this one. But you can see that milk is indeed 1.4, and yogurt is, uh, is higher in this uh, study, 2.4, mainly uh, uh, due to uh, processing, packaging, and distribution. So uh, packaging of yogurt is mostly smaller, uh, shelf life a little bit longer than uh, pasteurized milk, uh, and uh, the cooling, uh, uh, it, it takes more energy for cooling. So yogurt is higher than, than milk. Now cheese, of course, but, uh, and uh, butter is, is uh, still higher than, uh, than the other products. The main conclusion you should draw is that milk is the most important component in the greenhouse gas emissions. So at Farmgate, the, uh, most of the footprint has already been uh, realized. <coughs> so the question now is, uh, does the feed of a dairy cow compete with human food? Uh, and does it differ in the uh, intensive farm systems compared to the extensive farm systems? So let us uh, look at the Dutch cow. Uh, this is what the Dutch cow eat. Uh, it's eat concentrate, uh, fresh grass, grass silage, maize silage, wet byproducts uh, coming from different uh, feed and food chains. So the total uh, energy intake by a cow is 120 gigajoule per year. That's, that's a lot. Uh, and the protein intake is about 1,000 kilograms. But looking at the human edible fraction in the total feed, it is, uh, it is less than 10%. And that's important to realize. So a cow doesn't really compete with, uh, with human food, only a small fraction. And I think that is uh, normally neglected in the debate about the sustainability aspects of, uh, of, uh, of the dairy sector. If you look in, uh, at the world, the average uh, farm size um, in the world is, is three cows, and these cows eat all the rubbish around the house and convert it to the, to the richest source of, uh, of nutrient uh, you can think of. So looking at that way, uh, I think a cow is a, a good converter of uh, non-edible, non-human edible uh, food into a, a rich feed into a rich food. So the total uh, yield of uh, protein is uh, 200, uh, uh, 71 kilogram, is, uh, if you calculate that on a daily basis, it's about, uh, that's sufficient for 10 people. So um, one cow can feed 10 people uh, with uh, the required protein. Um, here you, you see that, uh, that how the feed, uh, only a small portion is, uh, is competing with the, with the human uh, uh, food product. And that's basically cereals and, uh, and soy. So how does a cow convert uh, the energy? So the energy intake, as I showed, was 120 uh, kilojoule. Um, it's uh, leaving methane. This, this is where the problem is uh, from a uh, sustainability point of view. 6% of the energy goes into methane. And it's uh, from an evolutionary point of view, very strange is that a cow wastes so much energy. And that's because uh, of the bacteria in the rumen. Uh, rumen bacteria generate uh, a lot of methane. Uh, so from that energy, 21% uh, goes into the milk, 2% uh, in, in meat, as that's the, the, the calf, and 35% in the, in the menu, and that's quite high as, as well. So we are now um, investigating uh, mitigation strategies uh, for methane. So if you look at what is happening in the, in the rumen, uh, the polysaccharides are, are converted to butyrate, propionate, and acetate. And only the acetate pathway uh, generates uh, hydrogen. And that hydrogen is uh, combined with uh, CO2 by the uh, methogenic uh, bacteria. Uh, and uh, without acetate, there w wouldn't be any methane. So changing the from, uh, so blocking a little bit the acetate route 
would uh, reduce the methane uh, production of a dairy cow. And that's one of the options we are investigating. And we also investigate that by, um, by feeding and breeding interventions. So we also look at, uh, at the cow genes, uh, what is determining uh, the pathways in the rumen, and how can we, uh, how can we uh, modify that. The other aspect is, uh, is manure. Um, so there's, uh, there's a lot of energy going into a cow. If you look at uh, the fossil energy used in the Netherlands of the whole dairy chain, that's a uh, 60 petajoule, that's uh, less than 2% of, uh, of the total energy used in the Netherlands. If you look at, uh, at the 35%, because this is uh, all the dairy cow, 1.4 million dairy cows in the Netherlands consume 200 petajoule. 35% of that is, uh, is almost the same amount of energy as is uh, used in the, in the total chain as fossil energy. So the dairy chain, in fact, can, if you win, can capture this energy, we may uh, uh, eventually end up with a fossil energy free dairy chain. Uh, and we are now trying to do that with, with biofermenters, uh, still not working very well. Uh, still, the technology has to be developed, but there's a high potential here to, to uh, mitigate the um, greenhouse gases of the, uh, of the dairy chain. Looking at proteins, uh, the conversion of proteins is 27% uh, uh, goes to the milk. Uh, here it ends up as, as nitrogen, of course, and 2% in the meat. So the, the proteins are even, efficiency of proteins a little higher than uh, than that of energy. So looking at the efficiency uh, of the protein on total basis, it will be 27%. On the human edible part, uh, it is more than uh, 400%. So if you're looking at the competition between, uh, between you, uh, uh, human and a cow, the, the uh, efficiency of a cow is in fact very high for the uh, uh, for the, the uh, amount of feed he gets. So the grass, we cannot eat the grass, and uh, all these uh, proteins are made out of uh, unedible proteins of, uh, uh, in the feed. So here are the, uh, the, the figures again. If you look at uh, other countries, uh, Kenya, uh, low efficiency, but uh, no uh, human edible, so the, the uh, the efficiency is infinite because there were no, uh, no human edible parts in the, in the cow feed in, in Kenya. So what are the uh, most effective strategies to uh, mitigate emissions and uh, increase efficiency? Is by just increasing productivity. You can see as yes, uh, if you have uh, fulfilled the maintenance requirements of a cow, the extra energy can go into, into the milk and you can see that uh, the energy intake per kilogram milk comes down as the milk production goes up. And the same is true for the connected uh, CO2 uh, emission per kilogram uh, product. So this uh, results from Kerber, that's from Thomas. You can see that uh, the higher the productivity, uh, the better the situation is with respect to the sustainability aspects and that uh, is both for uh, uh, intake, energy intake, as for uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. <clears throat> then another aspect, uh, the quality of a protein. Um, the quality of the input uh, protein is less than that of the output proteins. A cow actually can even uh, convert uh, nitrogen from urea into, into uh, milk protein. So um, if you look at uh, at the uh, quality of, uh, of the proteins, you can see that uh, uh, what kind of assay you are using. Uh, animal proteins are always uh, higher in, uh, in uh, protein quality score than, uh, than, the we than the plant proteins. Here you see the PDCAS uh, value. We heard already the, the new DIAS uh, uh, assessment. Uh, I only took the two figures from the, from the report. I didn't see any others because there is still a debate how to measure ileal uh, digestibility. I think the protocol has to be written uh, still. And here you see that uh, PDCAS truncates uh, the good, uh, the good uh, uh, proteins to one. Uh, 
and I can show you uh, the reason behind that. Um, one of the more important conclusions I did find in this report is that in uh, the dietary protein quality evaluation, the amino acids should be uh, treated as individual nutrients. So if you look at food composition tables, it is, in my opinion, not sufficient to say how much uh, protein is there. I think it is needed to, uh, to uh, have the complete um, essential amino acids there as well. Uh, because uh, looking at the efficiency of protein quality comes into the equation. Um, and that is done in the US, but it is not done in, in Europe, uh, in, all food, uh, uh, um, in all food tables. So here you have an example uh, how, how you can see what the, what the quality of a protein can do. Uh, it is a theoretical example, so the protein requirement in this case is uh, it's 1.12 gram per kilogram per day. That's for uh, the age category half uh, three years. And the amino acid requirements are also related to, uh, to this category. They are taken out of the latest report of FAO. So you can see that milk, uh, and that was already mentioned before, fulfills uh, the uh, indispensable amino acids uh, requirements before it fulfills the nitrogen requirements, so you can mix milk with a little uh, of poor proteins to get uh, sufficient nitrogen. Wheat, you uh, have to consume uh, a lot more, the same as for corn. Uh, beef is uh, like, like, uh, like uh, milk, uh, over uh, qualified, so to speak. And soy, you need to eat about uh, 20 to 30% more to fill, fulfill your requirements for uh, nitrogen indispensable amino acids. Uh, also, uh, complementarity is uh, an important issue. So if you, if you look at, uh, for, for instance, at uh, cereal yogurt uh, uh, breakfast, the combination of milk and cereals is almost ideal because milk, to compensate the lysine shortage of wheat, uh, you have to uh, mix it with 1.6 gram of milk protein to get your uh, uh, sufficient uh, score. Uh, in case of protein, you have to mix it with 6.2 gram of protein to get a score of uh, one. So this, uh, this is important in, in, uh, in diets where you have different proteins appearing. And I think, uh, again, uh, evaluating the uh, essential amino acid is a very important. Um, and that was uh, not done in this case. I was talking about um, the, the diet evaluation techniques via linear pro programming. And you can see here that, um, that in this case, this is a uh, UK diet uh, that uh, by uh, using the existing uh, food groups uh, and chasing the, the intake, you can see that you can uh, reduce uh, your greenhouse gases by almost 40% uh, without losing, uh, losing much of the dairy. So dairy, because of its nutrient richness, will always stay into the diet in this uh, in this uh, calculations, uh, and we have repeated that in the Netherlands as well, and with the same result, that um, you lose uh, you lose a lot of meat, uh, you increase fish, you increase of course the vegetables, but uh, dairy remains quite constant, and that's because of the nu nutrient density uh, of uh, milk products. So this was, uh, these are the conclusions. Um, so the milk play an important role in nutrient security. Um, only a small fraction of the feed protein is human edible, and grassland is often not suitable for growing other crops containing high portion of potential human edible proteins such as soy. And this is often neglected in the sustainable debate of dairy. I think this approach should, uh, should be on the table every time when we, uh, when we talk about uh, the sustainable aspects of dairy. Dairy cows uh, upgrade the quality of, of the human edible part of the feed uh, by at least a factor 1.3 for soy and 2.9 for grain. And not only the protein content, uh, but also the indispensable amino acid content should be part of a diet uh, quality evaluation. Thank you.